Greetings and hello. And I am back again with a new video explaining kind of the next uh, level of what the previous video that's been out there for a while, uh, kind of where it kind of left off. I mean, we covered a lot of different territory uh, of the entire stress strain diagram using Excel, how to find some of the points and so on. However, one thing that was left out in the cold uh, was kind of the way we found this, the yield strength. Now, um, I kind of found it by guesstimating and putting a line in there, and that's generally fine because the uh, precision of this is pretty flexible. Every sample is gonna be a little different. Every sample, even from the same batch, is gonna be different. So you don't really need it that terribly accurate. But some people wanted it that way. So uh, I'm going to redo uh, the, you know, some of that video. And this is just going to be from the extensometer. We're not going to go all the way to uh, the ultimate or the fracture or anything like that. Uh, but I hope to be able to bring you from this kind of basic data all the way to something like this. So we can actually see the, um, the stress strain graph and find the uh, 2%, 0.2 percent offset line, and then also the uh, yield strength, estimated yield strength. All right, so let's get at it. So what we want to do first is take the pounds and the deflection and translate them into stress and strain. Now the spreadsheet here is going to want to do things in an XY format. So that would mean that we would want strain first and then stress. So uh, just like in my previous video, we're gonna do it that way. So we're gonna put strain and I'm gonna label it inches per inch because sometimes uh, they get labeled in percent. So we'll just uh, specify that. And then we're gonna type in stress and it's gonna be in pound per square inch. Now, of course, if you're using uh, Metric units, you'll want millimeters and um, pascals or megapascals, fine. Okay, so our strain is going to be equal to our extensometer deflection and divide by our gauge length. Now, if we continue to do that and follow it down, we end up with bad things happening because all this stuff happens. That's again, because we are using this value that changes and increments every single time we go down. So it's B4 instead of B2. So we've got to change that. We can either use the dollar sign methodology like this, but I'm going to use a, uh, anyway, this will work, fine. Uh, I'm going to use a different methodology. Uh, in this case, we are using Google Sheets. And Google Sheets has come a long way. It's not as good as Excel in a lot of things, especially in, uh, in plotting, but uh, uh, learned a few things. So I hope to pass them on to you. So let's go to here. We're gonna right click here and go to defined named range. And uh, going to add this range of B2 right here. And I'm gonna call that gauge length. Okay. And notice I have an underscore here. Got to do that to keep the programmers happy. So instead of dollar sign B, dollar sign two, I'm going to put something a little more meaningful in here. Gauge underscore, oops, got to make sure I've got the caps right. All right. So I'm going to take that. And of course, my values shouldn't change. But not only do I have an issue with this, we got to make sure our decimal places are in the right spot. Uh, but these also are not consistent. You can't compare them very well. Ooh, now I can. All right. So just move that back one, and we are in good shape for all that. So we want to be able to keep these you know, fairly consistent so that we can compare and uh, watch the trends. Um, and also, you know, some of these or a lot of these decimal places are just not meaningful. So uh, you want to watch that. It makes it messy, difficult to compare, 
and not meaningful. Those are all bad things. So all good reasons to manage your decimal places in your spreadsheet. Stress, well, we have to have force over area. So we have to calculate the area. So I'm gonna do original area. And we do that by setting equal to pi. That's how we do pi times the original diameter. We're gonna square that and take that whole thing and divide by four. And again, decimal place management. Okay. And we're gonna make that into a named range. Let's call it original area. So now my stress is equal to the force divided by original area. Okay, manage that, drag that all the way down, and we have our stresses, which is nice. Okay, so we have our stress and our strain all labeled, everything good to go. So I take that, I insert a chart, and here is my chart. And notice how, because I set everything up all nice and nice, uh, it already has the labels and everything ready to go. Now, uh, I think that uh, Google Sheets has done a, a very good job of this. However, um, we can choose a variety of different charts. And you might say, oh, I'm gonna use the line chart because it puts lines between all these. Now it does look similar to the scatter chart. However, if you take a closer look and you actually uh, consider these points carefully, it actually um, has these points uh, different than a scatter chart. And it will, um, it, it is not accurate. So you need to use a scatter chart. And the problem here is that it will not connect these dots. I want it to connect the dots, but it will not connect the dots. Uh, you, not even going through uh, some of these customizations of the series, you know, you can put a trend line in, but that doesn't do it. You know, linear, um, none of these other things are gonna work. And definitely don't use this. This looks good, but it's not good. Okay, so don't do that. Um, unfortunately, that's just uh, the breaks with uh, Google Sheets. Well, <clears throat> that being said, uh, we are in, in fairly good shape here. However, if you'll notice way down the very early things here, there's weirdness going on here. And this often, especially if you use <coughs> my machine, is a factor of the machine and the, uh, the setups. Very often, in fact, the first 100 pounds or more are really not all that helpful because they are, um, the machine's just readjusting and resetting. And so um, until you get to at least 100 pounds and sometimes more, it really doesn't do much. So these values are really not very helpful. So I'm going to um, delete those. Now notice I'm not gonna delete the first uh, row. We're going to use that later, but it's going to be there to remind us of more or less where we came from. So I'm going to delete those rows. And now we just have that one point down at the bottom there. And like I said, we're going to use that. Okay, great. Um, that is our stress strain diagram. But again, if you look closer at that, you'll notice that these numbers aren't actually pointing straight down to zero. Now, theoretically, if we have zero stress, we should have zero strain. Now, it's most likely a factor of your machine setup or whatever that might cause some of that error. So you might have uh, some kind of added value that is on that uh, strain gauge or whatever it is, and um, it causes some irregularity uh, right in that lower region. So 
the pro uh, what we're going to do is we are going to make a new uh, set of data here that's based on the old set of data. So um, I'm going to start with our headers here, and I'm going to call this one our shifted strain, because I'm assuming that somewhere along the line, early on, something got shifted. And we want to uh, end up with the one that actually matches up with the theory. Is this kind of fudging the numbers? It is kind of fudging the numbers. But if you actually show what you're doing, as you should to your professor, uh, if this is what you're doing, <clears throat> then you will uh, um, that's that should be okay. If they want this data, if they want just the straight up data that you had, then do it. If they want something adjusted for uh, possible irregularities at the beginning, then I'm showing you how to do that. First thing we need to do, and we need to do this anyway, is estimate the elastic modulus. <clears throat> now, what you want to do with this is look at your stress strain graph. Somewhere along the line, well before it starts curving and well after the initial bit, you should have some data that is usually pretty good, straightforward. Notice these five points right here. Um, I'm going to choose the 10,000 one to the 17,684 one. And uh, they go in a nice, pretty good line. Just all you need are two points, and that will determine your line. And uh, so I'm going to do equals, open parentheses, and take the stress, yeah, this one, minus that one, and divide it by the corresponding strains. This one minus that one. Pretty easy. And we end up with an elastic modulus of almost 10 million PSI. So if you know which one that is, good for you. All right, that's uh, or at least what general type of metal is, that can be very helpful. All right, so um, we're gonna calculate a strain shift. And the way we're gonna do that is we're going to look at uh, we're just going to copy our stresses over equals this. I'm just going to copy those over so we can plot it a little bit better or easier. And um, now the question is, what is our strain going to be? Our strain shift is going to be equal to uh, the original strain minus what the strain should have been. How do we know what the strain should have been? Quote unquote should have been. Well, it's just the stress here divided by the elastic modulus right there. Okay, so our strain shift is this. So that means we are going to shift all of our strains by this. All right. But of course, this looks really bad because we did not use that uh, um, the the naming thing. So let's go name this. Strain shift, and let's try that again. D5 minus. Let's see if that works out better. Okay, well, I'd already adjusted the decimal places, so that's a little bit better. Okay, now one thing that we should uh, uh, definitely clear up here is that our original for the very top one, this is why I kept it, uh, should actually be zero, zero. So you would expect zero strain with zero stress. All right. 
So now we have our adjusted values that uh, conform a little better to uh, what should happen in reality. And I'm going to right click here and I'm going to change the data range. Best way to do that is click right here. Select all of those, G5 to H27, just check on that. Like, okay, good. All right, and now look at our graph. Looks much better, straight line right through there and so on. Okay, so that takes care of what happens when you have a shift in your data. Now, um, if you have that position data from the, uh, from the uh, machine, I do, I, for my class, uh, I would not expect that to uh, be shifted. Uh, for a strain, maybe like, you know, from the extensometer, maybe there's something that's screwed up with it, whatever. Um, a lot of your data actually starts with a zero and that's fine. Obviously that's good, but, um, uh, if you, the stuff from the machine, the position data, don't really care that much about the weirdness at the bottom. They're always going to have that. For the position data in the, on the machine, what we're really looking for is uh, um, the overall, uh, yeah. there, there might be an issue that you can calculate, use this to calculate for the, uh, the um, uh, percent elongation, because that might change because of what you've got at the beginning here. But uh, you know we're looking for the bigger, broader perspective, like the ultimate strength and so on. Okay, so now for the next step, the magic of finding the uh, yield strength. So the yield strength, the 0.2% offset yield strength. Notice how we've got uh, for this, we've got 0.025. What we're really looking for is 0.002. So it's gonna be about one tenth of that here. So it's gonna start about here, go straight up, go straight through and come in somewhere here, okay? And um, so we're gonna try to figure out where that is. So it's probably gonna be in the 23, 24,000 range. So that's also another reason that we wanted to calculate this elastic modulus. So what we want is a line that goes straight down through here. And actually, if we kept going, it would go negative here. So that's kind of our clue that it's gonna be going negative. I'm gonna add another column here and it's gonna be 0.2% offset stress. And that's also gonna be in PSIs. And we are going to assume that it's just the exact same line shifted. So we need the, just the same slope, which is right here. The elastic modulus is that slope and it's just gonna be shifted. Now you might think it's shifted to the right. That means it's positive. Well, that's true if you're talking about the strain, but since we're talking about the stress, the stress is going to be shifted it's more like taking that same line and moving it down. It'll have the same effect as moving it to the right, but we're gonna actually move that down. So let me show you what this looks like. So this is going to be equal to our elastic modulus times, open parentheses, our strain minus 0.002. And of course, there we go. Take that, drag it down. Ah, I did it again, didn't I? Okay, I should have, instead of using that. Oh, I never made it. Okay, so here we're gonna add this into the range. And Elastic mod, just keep it short, elastic mod. So oh, it likes that now. Okay, so we'll take that elastic modulus and we will therefore multiply it by the strain, but then we have to put in the offset. All right, so go back, back, back. 
Aha. So now we have uh, our values for each of these strains, but um, at an offset. So let's uh, see, just in case you don't believe me, I'm going to add a range here. I'm going to add a series. And believe it or not, this is going to work out. Trust me, even though it looks kind of weird and bad. Uh, I'm going to customize it so we can see it a little bit differently. Make it small. And I'm going to put a trend line in. All right, so now this looks all really weird and bad because I've got all this extra data way up here. Notice I've got you know, this number way too high compared to this one. We don't really need a lot of this data anyway. So I'm going to get rid of it. Um, got one, two, three, four, five bits of data I don't really need. So I'm actually going to delete them just to make things look a little bit more easily. Now, okay, so now you should be able to see that this looks like all the textbook ones to a certain extent and you've got this uh, straight line coming up through your other data. But what's all this garbage down below? We've got all these negative numbers. Okay, here's the problem, is if I go back to my data range and I say, oh, here's the series that I wanna do, and I'm gonna change it instead to just the positive ones, it again thinks that my very first one should be associated with my first strain, my second one with my second strain, my third one with my third strain. So it starts at back at zero, which is a royal pain, which it shouldn't do. So uh, I'm going to do something a little bit more, so, or a little bit trickier, so I can bend it to my will. So I'm going to go back, do all those. Okay. But then these, this data, this negative stuff is meaningless anyway. So going to delete it and now I've got my 0.2% offset line. Okay, so of course you probably should keep some of the data that's uh, that was uh, off to the right here, but I'm doing this so that we can more easily uh, see what's going on. Okay, so that's part of the battle. <clears throat> the next part is finding that yield strength. So obviously that yield strength is going to be somewhere here. I'm going to modify this chart here. Oh, you know, I want the grid lines and ticks. So the grid lines, you can either tell it to have a certain number of grid lines in between. So for the horizontal axis, um, I want uh, four grid lines in. Oh, that's the major spacing. I think that's fine. Minor spacing, it says none. I want four in there. Okay, so now I've got four in there. And then for the vertical axis, uh, likewise. Um, doing fine there. And I want four like that. So now it's every 2,000 in there. You know, if I put nine, it'll be every 1,000. Okay, that looks a little better. All right, so now I can see that like right here where this curve crosses that line, uh, it's gonna be right around 23,000. All right, but for those of you who that's not good enough for you, uh, we're going to get a lot closer. So what we have is we've got effectively two lines and we just have to find where they intersect. There are a number of ways of doing that mathematically, but I've got a, um, a way I prefer but these are gonna be between this number and that number. So what I'm gonna do is add a row, right click, insert one above. So I'm gonna add a new row here and gonna put in um, what I'm gonna call the yield strength bookends. And I'm going to simply say equals this stress here and equals that stress there. So those are the two bookends. And I'm going to add those to the plot. I mean, they're already on the plot. I'm going to add them in their own right. I'm going to add the series. And again, if you do it like this, it's going to add them all the way over here because there's the first one, there's the second one. You kind of think zero and 0.00025. So I can't do it that way. 
I've got to do it this way. Start there, go all the way down here. And it doesn't plot those, but it counts them. So now I have those in yellow, which is a lot of fun. All right, so now I've got those in yellow and I can now add in for a data series three, I can add in a linear trend line. So now I've got those two. So I can really see where they cross right there. But if that's not good enough for you, we are going to use some fun math to uh, estimate the yield strength. So oh, that should be Again, we always say estimate because we never know exactly what it actually is. I mean, it's, it's always a certain, there's plenty of uh, variation. So, so to estimate the yield strength, let's see if I can use the annotation on this to give you a better idea. All right, so what I have here is I've got a distance from here to here, and I've got a, another distance from here to here. Now, if I can add up those distances, I'll call them left and right. L plus R is the total distance. Now, if the left one is so large that the right one, compared to the right one, um, then, uh, that means that these two points are really, really, really close. If it's the other way around, if the left line is very, very small compared to the right line, that, that means these two points are comparatively very, very close. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this value here and of strain. So the strain... Um, and that's going to be of, uh, I'm just gonna call that. And I add it to this ratio of L over L plus R, and I multiply that times the change in strain. And that's from here to here, okay? And maybe we should just call that uh, strain L, whatever, on the left-hand side. Okay, so, so here's the change in strain. So I have this change in strain, and that uh, difference in strain, the bigger this ratio is, the more I add to that strain, or I might, if, if R happens to be zero, then I get L over L and I add the entire difference and we get uh, that, uh, that actual value right there. If L is relatively small, then we're going to be adding only this much strain, okay? And then from there, using our uh, line uh, and the uh, elastic modulus, we can calculate uh, the stress that's right at that intersection. So let's see what that looks like. I'm going to use our strain estimate is going to be equal to the left hand or the lower one here plus, now the distance here are the differences in stress. So the left here is the lower stress, so the upper one here, which is that one minus that one. So that's the lower stress of the bookend. I should have used the bookend then if I'm gonna do, call it the bookend. Um, here we go. The bookend, the lower bookend minus the 0.2% offset. And then I need to divide that by the total distance. So that is that same distance. Copy. Plus 
the other distance, which is the right. So that is the upper offset stress minus the upper bookend. Okay, so that, that is a complicated formula maybe for some of you, but hopefully you can understand what's going on here. So then I have yet to multiply that ratio. So that is just the L over the L plus R. And now I have to find the difference in strain. So the difference in strain is the upper strain minus the lower strain, these guys. Then multiply that all out. So I've got the lower strain plus the difference between lower and upper times what percent or what fraction of that difference we need to go with. And it ends up being a strain of 0 0.00432. Okay. And so then I just need to use that 0 0.00432 and multiply it by our elastic modulus. And I get a number that we weren't expecting. We were looking for something in the 22, 23,000 range. We end up with 43,000. Oh, what do we do wrong? Well, the problem is that we're trying to find it along this line, which is not the, uh, the elastic line, which is over here. That's what this would be. So if we uh, were following this line up to that strain, it would be way up here. That makes sense. We have to subtract 0 0.002 off of that strain. So let's try this again. We've got the elastic mod times this minus 0 0.002. So we have got to subtract that off and then we find our approximately 23,000 PSI. So we are almost done. Let me get rid of some of these uh, notes. And next step we're gonna do is we are going to plot this. And I'm gonna put another one right here equals this so we can plot this and make a nice uh, horizontal line here. So I'm gonna right click here, data range, gonna add a series there and then click on that range, hit okay. And now you see this, these two points here, going to customize it. So for this series, going to make a trend line, which is linear. And now that comes across and you could label this if you wanted to. And going to change some of these to 2.0. Same thing with this series, make it smaller. Okay, so hopefully this is easier to see. So we've got the blue emphasized because that's the main data. Got the red trend line of the 0.2% uh, offset line. The yellow line, we probably could dispense with that as a trend line. It just was helpful to see where things were intersecting. And then the green one indicates the yield strength. And that is an estimated, much closer estimate than uh, our good guesstimate of 23.07, more precise, whether it's more accurate, it's another story, but uh, um, at least we have a reasonable method by which we can nail down uh, 23,000 without uh, just saying, I guessed it and it kind of looks right. Okay, well, I hope this helps and make sure that you reference uh, this video if that's what you need to do to uh, uh, in a lab report. Uh, or maybe your homework if that's what it is. 
and uh, um, hopefully you will tune in for some other good videos. Good luck in your studies and take care.